You're listening to Black Girl Blueprint. Because Black Girls did it first. And honestly, better. Period. Period. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, everyone, and welcome to Black Girl Blueprint, your fave podcast for all the Gen Z Black Girl tea. My name is Lauren. And my name is McKean, and thanks for tuning into today's episode. We have a very special guest with us, Haley Colborn, who you might know as Miss Former Teen USA. She's also a current junior at Princeton University. And so today we're going to get into all the tea about representation, what it means to grow up without Black girl representation in your life, and also just some of the realities about like being a Black girl in college right now. And also just for Haley, what it feels like, you know, to be a big part of that representation for young Black girls in the pageant world and, you know, allowing them to see themselves as queens. So welcome, Haley. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast. I'm really excited for today's topic. Can you tell us and everyone who's listening just a little bit about yourself, so your name, your age, how old you are, where you're from, whatever you want to feel like saying. Yeah, so uh, my name is Haley Colburn. I am 19 years old and I'm from Kansas. I do not live in the country, though. I live in a very <laughs> like normal city here. Mm-hmm. Um, I competed in, I actually competed in pageants, my first one when I was nine. I did them for fun because I was really timid growing up and I still am just like a smidge, but they really made me comfortable coming out of uh, my shell and just talking to people. So I did that off and on growing up. And then I competed in my big pageant, uh, Teen USA, the, so May of 2018, I actually missed my graduation to compete and, um, (laughs) wow. And it all worked out because I ended up winning and we were really elated. We love to see it. Amazing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, Haley, and congratulations again on your win. And you. thanks to that, we have you here today. Before we get into the episode, we want to do our segment, Read the Room. So for those of you who are new, this is the segment in the episode where we chat about things going on in pop culture, in our personal lives, and also respond to any questions and topics that you guys have sent in. So Lauren, can you tell us what we'll be talking about today? Yes. So today... Reading the room, we thought it'd be very appropriate because as many of you know, and honestly, as many of you are probably experiencing right now, fall semester of college starts up very, very soon. And, you know, with COVID-19, online classes, everything's kind of up in the air right now. So, yeah, college is going to look a lot different now than it did before. So what are you two doing for the upcoming semester? Vicky, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Honestly, thinking about what's coming up this semester has been a daunting task. I've (laughs) like, part of me really misses being in New York and being on campus and, you know, doing all of the things that I love about college beyond the classes. And (laughs) for the flip side of it, though, is kind of like, even if I do go back, will I be able to sort of experience those parts that I do love? Like there Mm -hmm. won't be any parties, there won't be any clubs, there won't be any like social gatherings, really. So a lot of the things that I really do enjoy about college will be stripped, which is kind of terrifying and like has Mm -hmm. definitely influenced my decision. So I had to make the decision to stay home this semester. Barnard wasn't like like welcoming back juniors or seniors unless they were like specially approved. So I didn't really have much of a choice there either, but you know, all of my plans of like studying abroad, I was supposed to study at Spelman in the fall. All of that is done. So, you know, it's going to be me and my dad and my dog (laughs) for the next, (laughs) the rest of the year. (laughs) How about you, Haley? What's Princeton doing? Uh, Yeah. So Princeton is welcoming back freshmen and juniors for fall semester and then the other two years for spring. So I could go back, but there's this crazy social contract that's really strict, prohibits uh, larger gatherings, All of our eating clubs, which are basically where the social life is at, and they have all the parties, they're all shut down. And me being from Kansas, I would actually have to quarantine in one room for the first two weeks with meals delivered to me. So with all that factored in, it was a hard no. So (laughs) I'm just staying home with, like you said, my parents and my dogs and Mm -hmm. trying to be motivated to do work here. (laughs) Yeah. It looks like I'm the only one who's going back this fall. Then I'm spending the whole year on campus. I guess it's a little different for like international students because we do have those like, you know, special circumstances. But I'm going to be living on campus for the full year. 
all those things you talked about with like the strict social contracts, nothing to do on campus. That's going to be me. Probably very, (laughs) very bored. But yeah, for my special circumstances, fall semester is when hurricane season is in the Bahamas. So can't be doing online classes if you don't have any power. So (laughs) period. So yeah, that's what like it's going to look like for me. But yeah. Honestly, the second half of the spring semester was rough. Like Mm -hmm. Zoom University for me, it's not (laughs) it, you know, like it was fine. I got through it. I pushed through, but I'm thinking like that was only half of a semester and that felt like Mm -hmm. a lifetime. And Mm -hmm. sort of to think to do it again for a full semester after the summer also, it's just kind of like, not even going to lie. I'm scared. It's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We'll push through, but I have no idea what to expect. I'm kind of terrified. Yeah. yeah, I feel really bad for my bank account because I got into the habit of like <laughs> during lecture having my favorite stores open and like scrolling and shopping during exactly. lecture. Exactly. Yes. So I hope I don't continue that habit. <laughs> exactly. Honestly, literally same. All of it. And it's yeah. like, at least for me in the fall, they made classes pass fail. And so that kind of made me able to like sleep in and have my camera off in Zoom and like nobody had to know. Like I was in the class, but like I wasn't (laughs) doing anything. And like now they're not making things pass fail. So, you know, participation grades become a thing again. Like, Mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of dreading those, you know, 8 a.m. Zoom lectures from my bed. I don't know. That's scary. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Honestly, Mm -hmm. no. And also let's think about how they're, I don't know if Princeton's doing it, but Columbia is not reducing tuition for these online classes. So it sounds like a big scamming energy to me, but uh, right. listen. Yeah. Oh gosh. We we reduced it by 10%, I think, but it's kind of funny because usually when we get our grants or like our financial aid, they list out where each expense is going and like how much it costs for each thing. And I feel like mm-hmm. if I really did the math and like took out everything that had to do with housing, it would be more than 10%. So mm-hmm. a little bit right. of the same thing going on there. Yeah. For us, like I was going through my financial aid and there's still charges for like activities. And I'm kind of like, wait, 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 what activities am I going <laughs> to be doing on from your house? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> Zoom parties every weekend. Uh, oh, gosh. That's about to be the new thing, but we're going to have to get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Pre-game and the function is all over Zoom. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but anyways, all right, let's get into the meat of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we're going to really talk about representation today. And I really, we want to talk about a little bit first about your being crowned Miss Teen USA in 2018. But I also, you mentioned that you missed graduation for that. And sort of like, what was that like to sort of go into this sort of major moment in your life? What that also coincided with another major, major moment in your life, like graduating high school and entering college. Like, what was that like? What was your college process like because of it? you know, did it change how you started at Princeton? We want to know all of it. Yeah. So, um, I think for context in high school, I was like the smart girl, like the smart girl, the nerdy girl. Um, I knew I wanted to go to Princeton pretty early on in my high school career. So I was always really focused and that was always my top priority. And the pageant was kind of like the cherry on top, but, um, towards the end of my senior year when I was getting ready to compete it did get really stressful um I actually got picked on a lot by kids in my year um in high school that had never happened to me before I was getting harassed on like Twitter Mm. and it was a mess um I lost a lot of really close friends at the time but um you know people show their true colors when you really go for your goals and I kind of learned that the hard way So I was not mad about missing graduation one bit, even though I was supposed to give a speech. Period. Um, You go, queen. (laughs) Thank you. Wow. Queen of it all for real. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The pageant itself, um, I'm definitely not your stereotypical pageant girl. Uh, Like I mentioned earlier, I'm much more introverted. Uh, I love literature. I think most of my interview for the pageant was about like my favorite books and uh, where I was going to college and why I chose Princeton. So um, winning came as a surprise because I didn't really fit the archetype. But, mm. you know, I was really grateful and um, it changed my life. Like there's so many opportunities that have presented themselves that I know I wouldn't have uh, without the title. And um, 
the year, freshman year, and juggling the title and appearances that come with it was really difficult. Like I think my first semester, I was traveling almost every single weekend and Mm. my professors were not very sympathetic with my extracurriculars because, you know, in academia, pageantry isn't something that they really consider to be esteemed, um, even though it Mm. really can be depending on how you use the title. So um, it was rough. And socially, you know, I, mm-hmm. I would say no one would have cared if it wasn't for like the Instagram followers and a blue check mark. But um, people did treat me a bit differently. I think a lot of people wanted to be close to me to get like tagged in a photo or something really shallow like mm. that. And mm. it took me a hot minute to find like really good true friends that wanted to be around me for the right reason. Felt. Yeah. That's real. And that's like, yeah. it's trash that people really you know, that's such a huge deal. Like people might meet you first, you know, when you go into college, there's all of those like Facebook groups where people are introducing themselves online before Mm -hmm. they ever get to campus. I can only imagine where like, you're just trying to introduce yourself like everybody else. And people are like, wait, wait, wait. It's Team USA, <laughs> yeah. blue check mark. Like, let me, let me make sure that <laughs> the one I had down during NSA or like wearing exactly. or whatever. Like my mm-hmm. name would get, like people would introduce me by the title or like wouldn't say my name. And I'd be like, my name is Haley. <laughs> so Oof, right. <laughs> it was really weird at first. <laughs> uh-uh. no, I'm That's mm-hmm. Why did you choose Princeton though? A little bit about that. And you said you wanted to go there for a really long time. So what was it that really attracted you to Princeton? Yeah, so for most of my life growing up, I actually wanted to dance professionally. Uh, I did classical ballet for 15 years. But then I did a summer intensive with Dance Theater of Harlem, where you're dancing like eight hours a day, and it's super intense. And I still love it. I don't dance anymore. But that's kind of the moment I realized, like, wait, I need to go to college. (laughs) And um, I was such an overachiever. Like, when I say I was a nerd, I mean, from very (laughs) early on in my life, I, like, loved school. And I Googled best schools for writing because uh, I was really passionate about that at the time and still am. And Princeton was number one. And then as I grew up and learned how to do like more actual research about how um, to find out whether college is good for you or not, I just continued to fall more and more in love with the school. Yeah. That's awesome. great. And you're talking to a group of like girls who can definitely understand. We can relate. Always with a book, always trying to yeah. study. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Overachiever yeah. Black Girls Link Up. <laughs> Literally, Ivy League Black Girls. We, we relate. We relate. We got it. <laughs> Let's take it back like a little bit to, I guess, the beginning, beginning as we can call it. And having a talk about like, again, representation, like during childhood, especially. Who were some of your favorite like black girl characters growing up like you said in literature so any in books or maybe movies or tv shows and like honestly did you feel like you had enough of them uh no not at all like I remember when I was younger uh, I loved the Disney princess movies but I never saw myself in them Mm -hmm. and eventually I started to call Jasmine my favorite because she was the only one that like kind of looked like me and Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember when Princess and the Frog came out, my mom was so excited and she took me to the theater and it was like, obviously it's an amazing movie, but I felt so weird because I felt like she had to be my favorite now because she was the only black one. And we actually talked about that movie in one of my classes. It's really interesting how the black Disney princess is not only a frog for most of her movie, but she's the only one who's like story is based in hard work instead of some like Mm -hmm. magical reality or something Mm -hmm. to save her so we got it like I definitely did not have enough representation growing up and I felt um most of that pressure I think in ballet specifically um I was really insecure about my body growing up because I was the only black girl in the classes for all 15 years and um I was really inspired by Misty Copeland when she started to become more well-known because she was the first ballerina I had seen who was successful and actually looked like me. Mm -hmm. Right. That's so real. And I think, you know, that note about being the only black girl in our classes, like that was something that was my reality too. And I feel like Mm -hmm. when you're in those positions and you don't see the representation around you, but also like when you seek it outwardly and it's not there either, it can just Mm -hmm. sort of have this like confounding effect of just like, who am I? Like, where, like, show me someone who I can like see myself in, like, in a place that I also want to be, you know what I mean? Exactly. You can only imagine that. Like, do you think that the lack of representation 
ever sort of had an impact of how, how you viewed yourself within like societal beauty standards and like as you approached the pageant world and like as you sort of explored like your role in dance like did that make you think about sort of what role you played on the stage in that way I don't know most definitely um it, I like I said I felt it most jarringly within ballet uh because ballet is a an art form that's all about the aesthetics of the white body and um because of the way ballet technique was and just what like famous ballerinas looked like I could never forget that you know my hips were bigger my thighs were bigger or that my feet didn't have uh, high arches like a lot of the other dancers and um within pageantry I don't think I noticed it as much when I was younger because I was just there to have a good time but um as I started to grow up and compete in more serious pageants, there was a lot of pressure to be as slim as possible, which is really triggering for disordered eating. And there was a lot of pressure to straighten your hair all the time and to have these insane, like long extensions. So um, I think the pressure of like Eurocentric beauty standards in both ballet and pageantry um, are things I felt before I was even aware of what I was feeling and right. there are things that to be quite honest like I'm still struggling to unpack within myself and the way that I view myself now so um it definitely affected me and like I said it's still something I'm trying to figure out how to just unlearn mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's that process yeah I could definitely definitely relate to all of that and even what you were saying before about you know when it comes to that representation like you want to like see yourself in like any character that even looks like a little bit like you, even if they aren't like really supposed to be a black character. Like for me, that was definitely Katara in Avatar The Last Bender was my black girl representation, even though she's not a black character at all. The same thing with like, you know, Princess Jasmine and anyone really who, you know, had some type of melanin in their skin or like a little bit of kink in their hair. I'm like, oh, that's me. Especially relating to what you said about when we did get our Disney princess movie, it wasn't like the fairy tale ending that we deserved. And I feel like, well, I mean, it was a fairy tale ending, but like the fairy tale story and that, you know, the princess and her prince and it's all happily ever after, like for them to have, you know, the black girl movie be the one that was, you know, like, you know, not poverty, but like struggle and hard times and having to work on that, I think all kind of plays into the, you know, the strong black woman stereotype where it's like, you know, we don't have to be strong all the time. Sometimes we deserve to just like have fun and, you know, have that type of flowy story. So definitely think that's yeah. so, so important. And I think what you were mentioning as well with, you know, Misty Copeland and what that was like, why do you think representation is so, so important for young black girls? And how much do you think you relied on that representation to like get you through being the only black girl in those classes or to you know, just like see yourself or like have someone to look up to? Yeah. Um, on the first point, like the importance of representation. Um, now that I'm in college and I'm able to like study these issues, I'm learning so much more about why we're feeling the way that we're feeling. And one thing I've been learning the past couple of years is um, why beauty standards are so focused on white features. And it's because of uh, people like Sarah Bartram, I believe, you know, where they were like studying black bodies and casting mm -hmm. them as other or um, like the Jezebel stereotype and the justification against like sexual violence against black women because they aren't, they're stronger or they aren't as feminine, you know? And one, one thing that really broke my heart in a class this year was um, this court case in the sixties when this black woman was assaulted and the man, the white man was acquitted because he brought his wife to trial. And the lawyer right. was like, look at this pure flower compared to this black woman. Why would he leave her for this? So right. um, I mm. think representation is so important because it's been this like historical process to cast black women and black features as outside of the beauty standard or even the opposite of the beauty standard. And mm -hmm. um, now that I'm old enough to understand and acknowledge that, I'm seeing that representation was kind of like me being able to claim, no, this is not true. Like, look, I can be beautiful. Look, I can be a ballerina. Look, I can be a beauty queen, you know? And um, sorry, what was the second part of that question? 
you've honestly just already hit the nail on the head. Just about how, I guess, adding on to that. <clears throat> actually, you've already answered the question, really. It was just about how would you really rely <laughs> on that representation and why it was important. So definitely yeah. everything you mentioned is so, so important Absolutely. and definitely can relate, honestly, and on so many levels. I think that, I think there's a note also, like, like you're saying, this process of unlearning and this process of sort of like it being a process, you know, it's not like a moment mm-hmm. of like, I'm woke now. Now I know. Yeah. Now mm-hmm. I know. Like I've unlearned everything about myself. Like I now see myself in the light that I've always been meant to. Like it's not, it's not that. And I mean, I think there's even something to, to note about, like a lot of people might view you as like, oh, she must have this confidence because she is Miss Teen USA and like she got that crown and that must mean something else about her own identity exploration. But that's still a journey that like we're still in, you know, it's not something that I don't even know if it ever ends. Like, I mean, who knows? Yeah. We, have, we have a lot of time left, but <laughs> yeah, like that's not, it's never an instantaneous thing. And I think that's so interesting to think about. And I also think, you know, sort of thinking back to your time, like in pageantry before you were crowned Miss Teen USA and like even now after having received that crown and that title you know do you think that there were not only moments where you felt like insecure but did you ever like did those moments and like lack of representation really make you feel like am I supposed to be here like I've had those feelings of like imposter syndrome or whatever they call it like in classes and and wherever you are sort of questioned so did you like what was that like did you experience that a lot yes 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 all the time um, I remember the night I was crowned, they streamed the pageant live on Facebook, I believe, and mm-hmm. people comment. And, you know, every time a black woman is crowned, people comment monkey emojis, they comment blackface gifts, they comment these like really offensive things. Um, and I just remember one night I was in my room, like maybe a couple weeks after I'd won, scrolling through the comments. And it brought me to tears because people were saying like, oh, mm-hmm. she only won because she's going to Princeton. Oh, she's the smart girl. Um, one comment that really stuck out to me that is a lot to unpack is um, my first runner up, whom I love, like I adore her, but she's tall and she's blonde. And someone commented, oh, the first runner up should won. She looks like a Disney princess. And wow. uh, yeah, so I, yeah, I felt that like, imposter syndrome all the time because people <laughs> were critiquing my body because I'm shorter and I'm curvier. Uh, people were critiquing like my nose. Literally one thing that was commented on my entire year was the shape of my eyelid. So um, I think once you <laughs> win the title, people felt really entitled to just like pick apart every aspect of your appearance and your demeanor. And I felt imposter syndrome all the time. I think um, I was more sure of who I was um, in that time period, like before I won. But then once I got the title, I was wondering like, well, should I, should I be working out more to become skinnier? Should I um, do my makeup differently? Should I like act differently even? I felt like I had to become more on all the time and more extroverted than I actually was. So I would say it took me about half of my reign to become like really comfortable with who I was and kind of Mm -hmm. resistant to all the directions I was being pulled in. and to just say like, no, I'm going to be Haley. I'm going to be proud of who I am. And that's the Teen USA that they're going to get. But I felt that imposter syndrome all the time from the minute that crown was on my head. Wow. Wow. But I'm at I'm a so loss sorry. for words it's almost. Yeah. yeah. Let's start. Let's start there. Honestly. <laughs> like you, you don't deserve so that. Mean. Like, Thank you. The hate that yeah. I, I, and I can only imagine like what that must have been like, you know, we kind of talked about this already, but those are questions that I feel like arise naturally for anyone at that time in our lives. Like Mm -hmm. questions of like my style, how I talk, like those are questions that people grapple with throughout their whole time at college, let alone like those months and weeks before they start and even after they start. And Mm -hmm. I I can only imagine like how much, how tough it must've been to go through that, but sort of Mm -hmm. on a scale that's like far different than most of your peers are going through. So like, it's not even, you know, the the targeting but it's also like can people relate to me like is there anyone like is there anyone that I can draw from that like has been here before to like guide me through this I can only imagine like what was on your mind during that I'm so sorry that that happened to you yeah you did not deserve it you are our queen <laughs> nothing respect for you <laughs> are for our oh, team my, USA. My team USA. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and well, like one thing that I think is really interesting is um it, like it's no 
so representation is definitely increasing in pageantry. Like Miss USA, Miss Universe, and Miss Teen USA right now are all uh, black women. But right, um, huge moment. There's still like this nuance within the industry of what kind of black woman is acceptable. For example, if they compete with natural hair, it's like a very specific type of curl pattern that they want to see. Or um, even with like facial features, um, there are still like, there's this prioritization of like black women with more Eurocentric features or Mm -hmm. with like longer, leaner bodies. So like, even though representation is increasing, there's still this preference of Eurocentric features. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I've been studying a lot. That's something I'm actually, I got funding from Princeton to like make this documentary about that in pageantry, but it got postponed in COVID. So one year, but um, soon, soon, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's interesting because um, even though people are becoming more accepting it's like it happens like bit by bit like they'll allow natural hair but a certain type and they'll allow Mm -hmm. skin but like only this shade so there's still Mm -hmm. a lot more work to be done and there's still so much to unpack there too I mean not really just in pageantry but just in general thinking about like movies and tv shows I think it's where people have fought to get that you know blacker representation on screen and then you know the white directors and the white producers and like you know, the people who are pushing these Eurocentric beauty stamps will be like, okay, fine, here's your queen. And it'll be, you know, a light skin or or biracial or type three hair. And like, those Mm -hmm. are the type of black women that we get to see on the screen. And then it's almost like when you complain and be like, okay, well, that's not enough black girl representation. Where's the dark skin women? Where's the type four hair on screen? They're like, oh, but we already gave you black women on screen. It's almost like there's not enough room I guess, to be like, okay, that's not enough. Like, can we have all black types of black women? Can we have, you know, like plus size black women? Can we have so many different things? And also let's think about like moving like a little bit away from pageants, but just like representation in general about like the types of roles that black girls get when it comes to like being represented on screen. Like they'll give us like, you know, a black girl who's like a best friend or like maybe like a black teacher or like you know what I mean and like thinking about all the archetypes or like the stereotypes of like the types of characters that black girls get to play on screen and it's like why can a black girl never like be the like main character or like the main love interest or like you know what I mean it's like we get that representation but not enough to the point where it's like a level playing field if that makes sense and that's just so sad to me or even Absolutely. like if she is a main character, um, she fits into some sort of archetype, which often yeah. is like like the the exploitation of like black trauma. Like she needs a white mm-hmm. savior character, or she's the mammy, mm-hmm. or she's even like the Jezebel stereotype. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Or her whole story is like like we're seeing like we talked about in the Princess and the Frog. Her whole story is reduced to her struggle, or like her whole story is about race. Like yeah. I saw a tweet today. I think that was like, please just like give us a black girl whose plot is not about her race like no literally we live lives beyond like I know that I'm always black and like I navigate the world always as black but not every moment of my livelihood is like consumed by Mm -hmm. that you know like I have other things that I go through I have other like self-exploration that has to do with things beyond my race and like literally just you know like we're not you know our struggles are very much similar you could sometimes even like give us the same plot like I just would love to see you like give me something you know like give me a little bit more than just like oh like as much as I love stories about you know black girls who sort of fight for justice and like do these awesome and such profound things I just would love for some spotlight to be on just like a normal black girl which I also think is like not that you are anything you're beyond normal but I think there's also some usefulness in like the fact that you said you were different from the other pageant girls not in just that you were black but because you like to read and that you were you were smart and that was not considered normal or standard for mm-hmm. that stage or that platform, whether or not that's true. You, I'm sure some of your peers were, you know, at high level institutions or whatever it might be. But I think, you know, it's it's important that we're seeing like different ways for Black girls to be. Like Black girls can be the valedictorians. Black girls can be the Miss mm-hmm. USA all in one. And it doesn't have to mm-hmm. be like one or the other. And I think that's really what's What's so important about, you know, your, you having won, won that title 
So kudos to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I did have a question a little bit about like what, you know, did you anticipate any of like sort of thinking about the struggles and like the backlash that you faced after getting the title? Like, did you anticipate any of that before you actually started in the Miss Teen USA competition? Did you like, were you able to look to any other black women or girls in the pageant world for like advice or inspiration? Um, well, I, I definitely didn't anticipate it. To be honest, I didn't even expect to win. Like I just wanted to finish it and go to school. But um, I was definitely caught off guard at first because I didn't know that that was normal. But the the girl who crowned me, she's a Latina. Her name is Sofia Dominguez. And she was a, just a great friend to me during that time. And she told me a very similar thing happened to her when she won. And, you know, I was having a really hard time during my year, but then um, Nashana Barber, who is the most amazing woman, she was Miss USA 2016, and she was also like serving in the army while she was Miss USA. She's wow. amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was actually giving a talk at Princeton and we grabbed lunch and she was telling me how much of the same thing happened to her throughout her year. And even when people were commenting initially after my win. She was one of the only people that used her platform to really stand up for me and speak out against what was happening. So I did not expect it at all. But um, there are so many amazing women that went through the same thing that were just like wonderful mentors to me. And that's why I'm really passionate about um, this documentary, this project, because I want them to have the opportunity to speak about the negatives, you know, because when you're Mm -hmm. this like queen, people don't want you to like, talk about the racist comments you're getting. So I'm, right. I'm really excited to be able to give them that platform so that they can have that cathartic experience of sharing those stories as well. Mm. I think that's beautiful. I, I, I literally, we cannot wait to watch this documentary. <laughs> and I think Thank it's you. so important that you talk about that. Cause like it's like you said, like when you are a queen or when you do have this platform, people don't really want to you to talk about like, the negative stuff or like the nitty gritty or like, you know, the stuff that's not so like aesthetic or glamorized about like what it means to be a queen. So I think breaking that down and being like, no, there's these things that are happening behind the scenes and these important issues that we need to talk about, I think is so important and so amazing and such a great way for you and all these other queens to be able to use your platform. So big kudos to you, honestly. Yes. And I think we do love to see it, honestly. (laughs) And I think Going a little bit off of that, what is it like now that you were speaking about, you know, you had those mentors and those people who were like there for you after you were crowned and could share their experiences. I guess for you now, two years after you were crowned Miss Team USA, what does it feel, how does it feel for you to now be that representation for young Black girls who are coming up in the pageant world or, you know, who may be experiencing similar things? Do you feel like a sense of responsibility? Do you feel like that's why it's important to be vocal about these issues to kind of inspire them and motivate them? Yeah, no, I I definitely feel both a sense of responsibility and it makes me feel, I'm looking for the right word. It feels kind of like a justification of what I experienced to know Mm -hmm. that it wasn't for nothing. You know, I I almost get emotional when I get like a message or a girl comes up to me like at another pageant because um, during that year when a lot of that was happening, I felt so alone. And there were so many times when I was traveling by myself where I I had that imposter syndrome and I I would like call my mom in tears. So Mm -hmm. it just, it feels so amazing to know that being vocal about that experience um, actually connects with people and um, it wasn't for nothing, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here for it. Yeah, my That's heart's beautiful. so full. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I was honestly, lost for words. I'm just... I'm like, it, shoot, I wish I was 10 years younger and about to start a pageant. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm like, I want to be my role model. It's time for me to be a pageant queen. Honestly, Wait, no, I'm about to watch this documentary. Yeah. Like, <laughs> literally, so I'm about to like Miss Universe Bahamas catch me in a couple of years. Honestly, <laughs> you know. Well, let's like you know thinking about what's next. You know, you've mentioned this um, documentary, which amazing. Again, I we will not stop gassing yeah. you up for it. Just no, exactly. <laughs> but what are you thinking down the road? You know, thinking after college, where do you see yourself? 
in five years? Like what work are you excited about doing? You know, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, so I'm I'm very passionate about writing. And um, I started thinking about a few years ago, I started thinking about writing and art as a form of social justice in and of itself. Mm. Because mm-hmm. I like I love politics. Um, I worked in politics for a little bit. I worked on Cory Booker's campaign last summer. But cool. you can only do so much in that industry. And a lot mm-hmm. of the time it does get kind of um, slimy, you know, and yeah. um, that's why I, I kind of really feel justified in pursuing art. And um, like an example of art is social justice is like Ava DuVernay and all of her like films are really getting people yep. to open their eyes. And mm-hmm. like a TV show as simple as Glee um, helped kind of humanize like the LGBTQ community to so many people that were homophobic before. So um, mm-hmm. I'd like to pursue screenwriting. Um, I'm okay. doing an internship right now on that avenue because, you know, like the reason we're seeing these archetypes or lack of representation in television and films is because there aren't people in those rooms making those decisions to stick up mm-hmm. with black people or just other minority communities. So um, that's the industry I'm pursuing. And um, I really want to be like a champion in those rooms so that we can get the representation that we really deserve and need. I'm here yes. for it. Yes. We will not stop hyping you up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Feel so loved. <laughs> no, that's what this is all about. Love and honestly hyping you up for your accomplishments because we know it's not always easy, but the work that you're doing is important and we applaud you for it. This documentary, the screenwriting, if you need someone to be cast as a non-archetype in your movie, let me know. Honestly, <laughs> I'll be an extra. I'll be, literally, we'll be extras in the back, just like, you know. But just as kind of a final concluding question on what we've been talking about and everything, what are some of the biggest improvements or changes that you want to see on a widespread global stage when it comes to representation and inclusivity for Black women and for other minority groups? Yeah, so I think what we were talking about earlier um, in film and television, just um, seeing more people like us whose, whose entire plot lines aren't dependent upon a stereotype or trauma I think mm-hmm. that's really important. And I think there are steps being taken now um, that I've seen with the company I'm working for right now that are moving into that direction. So I think like the the activism that's going on right now is having an impact in the entertainment industry. Um, another thing that I think is so important that's really visible in pageantry, but happens everywhere is just like further unpacking that beauty standard and why mm-hmm. like a certain type of Black woman is considered what's acceptable so um I think just awareness and kind of re-examining the history of why everything is the way that it is is really important for that and um mm, the third one I think a third one would be and we're definitely seeing like an uptick of it right now with COVID and the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement is like less performative activism. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, like mm-hmm. I think that having allies is amazing, but I think right now so many people and companies are being exposed for only being like with the Black community when it's benefiting their image. And right. I Speak think on to, to really like, have true allies that are doing things to help champion the black community is um, a big step that we like need to be seeing right now. A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so, so important. So that last point that you mentioned when it does come to allyship, I think understanding that some of it is performative and not genuine is so, so important. And also looking for the people who really only try to be allies when there's like a hashtag for them to spread around or like when there is like a quote unquote movement going on and that's when they decide to use their voice. Like this is not a moment. This is not a movement. This is like real people in our lives and our fight for justice that we have to do every single day. So definitely cut out the performative We're We're not, we're not here for it at all. Right. Like you said, you just reminded me of those, like people are calling out on businesses increasingly now about like not only 
like saying that Black Lives Matter, but also like showing us what your boardroom looks like and like exactly in mm-hmm. those rooms. And I think mm-hmm. it's so, you know, for me up until these like recent times, I had thought of, you know, this is a whole other conversation in and of itself, but I had thought of like performative activism as something like individuals do. But when you really think about like, okay, if racism is systemic, then the activism that accompanies it can also be. And if that activism is performative, then it's like, I don't know, like, is it enough for a company to post Black Lives Matter? Like, is it enough for Target to post Black Lives Matter and only have like less than 1% of their companies be Black owned? That's the question. But <laughs> I, I don't know. That's a whole other conversation. I think you made a good point about like, we just want to, we, we not only want to be in the room, but we want to have a voice in the room that is able to be heard. And like that you guys mm-hmm. are not like pointing a mic to, like, I want you guys to amplify it. I don't want to have to shout for my own. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So I think we're excited to see you do that work in the film industry and in the documentary world and whatever screenwriting you do in the future. I can't wait can't wait for this documentary (laughs) send us the link when it launches and we will post it everywhere everywhere (laughs) thank you so much (laughs) Mm -hmm. absolutely just as a last thing that we like to do when it comes to our episodes um ending on kind of a positive or like uplifting ish note um (laughs) is just talk a little bit about things that we're loving right now so um we've talked about like albums that we're listening to or TV shows that we're watching or anything that's just bringing us joy and happiness right now. So whoever wants to share first can let us know what you're loving right now. Actually, I I can go first. Let me, let me get the ball rolling. I think for me, definitely, I don't know if you guys heard Jaden Smith's new song in the music video for Cabin Mm -hmm. Fever. That's what I've been listening I to. I love Jaden Smith. I love Willow Smith. Wait a minute is a bop. So that's what I've been listening to. Right oh, now. Willow. It's Willow's song? No, no, no. Jaden's song. But I was saying I love both oh. of them. I love both. Yes. We love okay. we stand Willow Smith. <laughs> and the house. whole family, to be honest. Yeah, we do stand the family, <laughs> honestly. I have not heard it. I'm going to have to listen to that. I think something right now that I'm loving, but also having a really hard time with, is Beyonce's Black is King because I adore Beyonce and everything that she drops is gold to me. But there's also been a lot of conversations, which I think we'll get to later in the season. So wait on it, but about like, how can I love Beyonce and hate capitalism and how how can I like want? Yeah. (laughs) Which has been like, honestly, an internal dilemma for me. Cause I still Mm -hmm. love her and I still think she's amazing. But I saw a tweet that was like, what? what is blackness to Beyonce beyond wealth? And I was like, oh my God, I don't know. (laughs) And I honestly like started to question, I was like, am I fake like in the movement if I stand Beyonce? (laughs) But am I fake in my standing of Beyonce if I'm anti the wealth concept? And so it was hard. (laughs) I'm still going through it. (laughs) That's still something I'm loving right now. No shade to Beyonce. Don't, if you're listening, don't take this as any shade. I am the biggest... Queen Beast. I love how we think Beyonce's meet. listening. Beyonce, hi. Right. Beyonce, if you ever hear, <laughs> know that I love you. <laughs> how about you, Haley? What's something that you are loving? Yeah, so one thing I'm loving at the moment, it's kind of embarrassing. I watched all of it in like three or four days, but <laughs> it's the Umbrella Academy on Netflix. I just finished it. I, I sorry. So good. Not to cut you off, but I no, it's been so good. It has night. like a. Um, pretty diverse cast like Mm -hmm. it's giving me like series of unfortunate events for adults like it's so good I I feel that I read like the first series of unfortunate events book I didn't go through the whole series but I feel the vibes I feel what you're talking about but yeah we love (laughs) Umbrella Academy Umbrella I haven't heard of it I'm gonna have to check that out it's a show it's Mm -hmm. a show how many seasons are there two Okay, seasons. I can do that. <laughs> Two seasons, I can do that. All right, well, I'll get back to y'all. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that is all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And special thanks to Haley for joining us and being our guest this week. Everyone go check Haley out on Instagram at Haley Colborn. And Haley, do you have anything to plug here that anyone should keep an eye on? Um. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel that I post on kind of often. Uh, I post a lot about college, so... Yes. So okay. Check her out on YouTube as well. Awesome. And so Haley, again, 
It's been such a pleasure having you on today to everyone listening. Also, make sure to tune into next week's episode where we'll be talking all about the entertainment industry and what it's like to be an actress. Um, Sully Griggs will be on as our guest, so that's really exciting. So, yeah, make sure to keep us with us on Instagram at Black Girl Blueprint and feel free to send us any questions or discussion topics for the Read the Room segment by DM or you can shoot us an email at blackgirlblueprint at gmail.com. So again, for the millionth time, thank you, Haley, for coming on. This yes. was a great, great thank conversation. You. And yes. see you all we'll see you next you week. week. Bye. Bye. Bye.